Welcome back for chapter nine of the book of Exodus. Hope you guys are really enjoying these videos. Um, leave us in the comments what you're thinking uh, as you watch these videos uh, and share them. If you have other friends and families that you'd be, you think they would benefit from watching these videos to understand the Old Testament better, please share them. Share the link out, copy it, post it on social media, email it, text it, whatever, to help more people to learn. That's, that's the whole point of these videos is just to help people really understand the scriptures better. Uh, we, we do, you know, take them from a more LDS perspective, uh, as well as put in there lots of other archaeological or research and other things there as well. Um, but realize that this is just good understanding for Christianity. So even non LDS people might enjoy these videos as well. So just share them. And uh, that would be great. That would appreciate that as well. All right, let's jump into chapter nine. So we're into the in the middle of these plagues. Several plagues happen in the last chapter. Now we're getting some more plagues, some more things happening because Pharaoh has changed his mind now for the second time and has double-crossed Moses, basically. So the Lord destroys the cattle of the Egyptians, but not of the Israelites. Boils and blains are sent upon the Egyptians. The Lord sends hell and fire upon the people of Pharaoh, but not upon the people of Israel. So with the in the last chapter, the final uh, plague that they experienced was flies. But only the Egyptians got the flies. The land of Goshen didn't get it. So now as these plagues are getting crazier, uh, they're not affecting the Israelites. They're only affecting the Egyptians, basically. So something that's kind of an interesting idea is that, is that uh, comes, to, comes to pass there. So verse 1, uh, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if thou refuse let them go, and wilt hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, upon the sheep, there shall be a very grievous moraine, meaning plague upon your animals, basically. And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall nothing die of all that is the children of Israel. So this is what's happening. So now, I mean, we've had plagues and some of these plagues have, you know, we had blood, then we had frogs and the frogs died and then lice showed up and now, and then we had flies showing up. So those ones kind of have some logical connections to them in a way there that you can almost kind of see logically how some of those would come about. Um, but now we have a plague that's hitting the animals. I'm sure the animals are feeling the dehydration problems, sickness from these other diseases and stuff. So the plague that we're going to have now is the cattle and sheep and everything is dying. Now, this is a big problem because other than having land, having lots of animals was a symbol of wealth. So now this is going to be destroying the wealth of the Egyptians, basically. If you remember, it wasn't more than a few hundred years ago. They were extremely wealthy people because they had more grain than everybody else around them. And that seven years of, of plenty, seven years of famine with uh, Joseph of Egypt. So Egypt is a pretty wealthy place. And now they're going to lose a lot of their uh, assets as far as animals and things. So this is not going to be a good thing. Economically, this is a big problem for Egypt. So... Uh, verse five, and the Lord appointed a set time saying tomorrow, the Lord shall do this in the land. So, so now Moses and Aaron have to go up to tell that, uh, uh, tell Pharaoh, this is what's going to happen. Verse six, the Lord did that thing on the morrow and all the cattle of Egypt died, but the cattle of the children of Israel died, not one. So this is a big deal. All of a sudden they tell him, if you don't let him go, here's what's going to happen. I'm sure. It didn't happen, so all of a sudden everybody dies. All the animals are dying all over the place. So the only people with with animals are the Israelites. And so if you needed food, if you need meat, if you need uh, an animal to help plow fields or be a, a work animal or a transportation animal, like a donkey or something, you now, Egypt has to go buy them from Israel because Israel has the, has the asset. Egypt's losing their asset. So it's, it's economically really changing things here as well. I think we forget animals are a very important economic factor at this time of life. Okay, If you remember back when Jacob uh, was dealing with his uh, uncle Laban, 
Okay, Laban kind of hosed Jacob for a few years out of some deals. And uh, Jacob was blessed by end up getting his animals were giving birth to very healthy animals and Laban wasn't. And so Laban got mad and offended because again, Jacob became wealthier faster than Laban. Uh, uh, but uh, then at the end, Laban couldn't argue with uh, where Joseph was basically because he just, that's how it worked out. And that was the deal. All right. So verse seven, uh, sorry, I think we just read that one. Verse eight, the Lord said unto Moses and to Aaron, take, to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and it shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So these are blisters, postules, uh, kind of things pulling up on people. So they're going to get boils and blisters and things all over their body. Uh, and so they did this thing with the dust, the ash, you know, in front of Pharaoh, Pharaoh saw it. And then all of a sudden all of these blisters and problems come. And some of this, again, you kind of see some logicalness. I mean, if you have that many, that much lice and that many flies, you're going to have disease. And so killing the animals off, having this, there's some logical, logicalness to this, but the speed at which this is happening is probably so much faster than you would think it normally or logically would happen that I'm sure it's astounding. Uh, to Pharaoh and the Egyptians as to what is happening here. Uh, so this is what happened, basically. In verse 10, they took of the ashes of the furnace, stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil, breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. They couldn't stop him. And not, they couldn't even heal themselves. And so they were sick. They were suffering from this and they couldn't perform their duties, basically. So this is, this is bad. This is not just, we don't know how he's doing this, but oh my gosh, we are now sick and have problems because of this. And I'm sure that was extremely painful to have all these boils and blisters all over your body. Verse 12, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Now, Joseph Smith's translation, and Pharaoh had hardened his heart. So just, again, that's part of those things where it got misinterpreted or mistranslated. And it's not the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart. It's Pharaoh choosing to harden his heart, basically. Verse 13, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. So this is like the sixth or seventh time that Moses has done this. Uh, basically has stood him for in front of uh, Pharaoh and said this almost word for word. Uh, verse 14, for I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. So these are about to get worse. And again, these are just the Egyptians getting this. This isn't everybody getting this. Just the Egyptians are getting this. Verse 15, for now will I stretch out my hand that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence. And thou shalt be cut off from the earth. This is about to take a whole nother level of problems that's going on here. Because he's basically being threatened. Like, look, if you don't change your mind, you and the whole nation is about to be wiped out, basically. Uh, verse 16. In every deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. So telling Moses, this is why, this is your mission. This is why you are here. I have raised you. You were born. You were raised. You're here to show forth my power on the earth, basically. Verse 17, as yet exaltest thou thyself against my people. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. That wasn't the Lord telling Moses that. That was, that was the Lord sending the message through Moses to Pharaoh going, look, the whole point of your existence is so that we can, I can show forth my power, basically. Uh, and, and that could be true. That could be part of why Pharaoh was in that position he was and Moses and everything else. The dynamic was set up on purpose for these very things to happen so that the Lord, my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Because if you think about it, what has happened since these stories? I mean, everybody through antiquity, even our modern day, still know these stories. I mean, movies are made about them. Cartoons are made about them. We hear about them all the time. Because they are amazingly sensational stories. I was going to say crazy stories, but it's it's phenomenal what happens here. And so they're going to be heard all over the world. Uh, now, of course, we don't have record of this in Egyptian history. 
uh, no mention of Moses or these things happening, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it didn't happen. It just means that either they didn't write it down or they destroyed those records. You have to realize that that uh, victory goes to the winner and history is usually written by the winner. And uh, even the loser, sometimes it is not uncommon in Egypt, especially to hide or try to delete people out of history. This is actually why King Tut is so famous today. Okay, this is, we think of King Tut, this boy king, uh, he was made Pharaoh around the age of like 12-ish, somewhere around there. Uh, and then he, he died around, I think, like 19 or 20 years old. Um, why was this boy king there? Why did this all happen? Well, it's because his dad, um, oh, I just forgot his name right off the top of my head. Uh, his dad completely changed Egypt. He tried to get rid of the polytheistic philosophies of the uh, temples in Egypt. He tried to build a whole new central city out in the desert and uh, become a monotheist, worship one God only. And so, which basically he fired all the priests and the magicians and they were some of the wealthiest people in Egypt. They were the power class. And uh, they had this power dynamic with Pharaoh that they, Pharaoh fed them and, and took care of them and gave them wealth because they would then take care of Pharaoh after his death so that Pharaoh could receive resurrection uh, in the next life. So there was this power dynamic that they had and, and King Tut's dad fired everybody, wiped them all, just said, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to move out here to this desert. We're going to build a whole new city. We're going to start and be a monotheist society and we're change it. And uh, rumor has it, speculation is that the priests uh, poisoned his dad and killed him. So now he's got this young teenage son coming up who's next in line because of those bloodlines that would happen. He's still the son of the queen. So he's the next in line. So, uh, but what happened was the, the second in command, the grand vizier, kind of the high priest uh, who would have been the right hand man of Pharaoh kind of takes over being Pharaoh for a while as this young man grows and matures. When he finally reaches an age around 18-ish where he can take over and be more legitimate, legitimately the Pharaoh, make decisions, then the Grand Vizier has to kind of step aside and share that power with him. And uh, they, from the story, as the story goes, uh, King Tut had a sister. And remember, it's the women who have the blood rights to who is Pharaoh. You have to marry or be born of the proper woman in order to be Pharaoh. And so the queen is old and she's she's kind of passed on. And uh, so we have this young Pharaoh, King Tut and his sister. And so what we find out is uh, the Grand Vizier kind of likes his sister and kind of starts trying to convince her to, to like him too. And she's like, this dude's a creepy, this dude's creepy. So when King Tut gets killed, uh, and they, we pretty much have a lot of evidence that he was murdered, um, she kind of becomes that power spot there for a little bit because she's a woman that has that bloodline, being the, the, the sister and the daughter of the queen, the former queen and things. So the Grand Vizier basically uh, marries her to become Pharaoh. And she doesn't have to stay alive for him to maintain his status as Pharaoh. Once he's Pharaoh, he's been Pharaoh for a while, and that's established, she can go away. So the Grand Vizier marries her. They become husband and wife, uh, probably in a forced marriage. And then uh, she actually writes letters to someone in another country. And this is how we know some of this. These letters still exist. And she's like, I think he's, I think my husband's going to off me. He's going to kill me, take me off, and then go find another wife and move on. So he's kind of usurped this power. So when that happened, when, when King Tut's dad was killed, uh, they still gave him the full burial as if nothing had happened because, oh, he just suddenly died. Oh, 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 and then they move everything back to the way it used to be. And they try to hide that ancient city. There's still some ruins of it. In fact, King Tut's dad was not buried in the Valley of the Kings where most of the kings were buried. He was buried in the desert in another place. And we have discovered his, his burial. But why is King Tut so famous is because he's this son of the, the, known as the this guy known as the heretic king. Um, uh, Tutankhamun was King Tut, um, his father, um, oh man, it's like right there. But anyways, you can go look it up. It's a fascinating, really fascinating story of Egypt. Um, so King Tut 
his they gave him the full burial and everything like to, to show the world show the rest of egypt oh he died this is sad let's give him the full barrier burial kind of make it look like it was all legitimate and everything's fine to get people to not think about why did he die so early what was going on with that but they wanted to hide him so they actually buried king tut's tomb was behind a wall of somebody else's tomb so usually there's the hallways in the in the carved into the mountain where the valley of the kings is and then in those hallways you would have another like set of stairs you'd go down or another extra private hallway you'd go down to get to the tomb rooms and there's usually two rooms there's one room where all the assets of the pharaoh was and then the next room is the chamber the tomb where the pharaoh's sarcophagus would be in the canoptic jars and things like that um so they what they did for king tut is they actually put his tomb they cut a wall through one of the other ancient pharaohs and uh, cut a hole a doorway went in built another tomb off of his and then buried tut and then rewalled it up and covered it up so that no one would ever know there was an opening there so after all the the uh raids through you know whenever egypt goes into disarray all kinds of problems, those those intermediary periods and things. It wasn't common, uncommon for people to go, we're poor, we're destitute, what do we do? Hey, the Valley of the Kings, there's riches, there's wealth. The, the pharaohs have been buried with their wealth. So they would go and raid these tombs and get all the wealth out, out of them, which is why we don't have as much. Uh, some of the bodies, we even find the, the mummy sitting on the ground outside the sarcophagus. Some are in the sarcophagus, but they've been damaged uh, because the tomb raiders have destroyed all of it and stolen all the wealth away from them. Well, no one knew where Tut's tomb was. So they never found it until the early 1900s. And then they finally discovered it. Somebody was looking and went, wait, there's something else here. And they found it because the tomb raiders never saw it. All of his stuff was intact. So he's given us a huge glimpse of Egyptian history. And because the, the, uh, the priests were trying to hide Tut and his dad from Egypt, they wanted him wiped out from history and never to be known of again. But because they buried him properly to an extent, but hid him, the Tomb Raiders never found his stuff. And so he is now like the most well-known popular pharaoh we have because we know so much about him. And he's helped us to enrich our understanding of Egyptian history because of it. And because of that, we learn, oh, here he is. How does he fit in this line? Here's where he is. Oh, here's his dad's name. Wait, we don't have his dad's name on the other official lines. What happened? What's going on? Oh, look, we actually found out this tomb and we found his dad's name on that tomb. Now, so all the pieces have been coming together in the last like 150 years for ancient Egypt. So it's it's fascinating that, that uh, you know, there is precedent in Egyptian history that they were trying to wipe off the history they didn't like. And so there's a good chance that's why we don't have the story of these in Egyptian lore is because the official records were wiped clean, basically. I'm sorry, a little bit of a rant there, but Egypt has some cool history. Well worth studying. Well worth studying. Okay, let's see. Uh, all right, verse 18. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hell, such as has not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home. The hell shall come down upon them, and they shall die. Uh, so this is, there's hell coming, and it's going to be a hell storm like has never been seen ever uh, since the founding of Egypt. So we're looking at going back to just a little after the flood, when this kind of destruction, you know, it's not quite as bad as the flood destruction, but this is going to be massive destruction, basically. So crazy times. So they've got boils on them. Their, all their animals are dead. I'm sure their crops aren't doing so hot either. Uh, you know, the children of Israel are doing fine. They're not sick. They don't have loss of their cattle, uh, but they're being warned, bring your cattle in. Don't let your, leave your cattle out to graze. Bring them in so the hell won't get them, basically. Verse 20, that he feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh, made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And that he regarded not the word of the Lord, left his servants and his cattle in the field. So that uh, this is one of the challenges that we have in understanding some of these uh, ancient documents is they, they're they not specific in some of these on who subject the subject of the, the sentence is. Because in verse 20, he that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. 
Verse 21, and he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. So it's important for us to understand, we don't know exactly who this is, but it sounds like they are. there were some servants of Pharaoh that believed in Moses. And so they went and pulled their cattle in. And the ones who didn't believe in Moses did not pull their cattle in. They left the people out to guard them and to, to watch them. And they left the cattle out there. So some people in Pharaoh's court believe Moses and some don't. That's what we get from verse 20 and 21. Verse 22, and the Lord said unto Moses, stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hell in all the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hell, and the fire that rain ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hell upon the land of Egypt. So there was hell and fire mingled with the hell very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Now, this is crazy. This isn't just hail. If you've ever been in the Midwest or the South during a hell storm, some of those storms are crazy and they get big golf ball, even baseball sized uh, uh, hail. I've seen some when I was down there. It's heavy stuff. I mean, that's just crazy to see what it does to a car and, and people. I'm telling you, if you get whacked with one of those, you're going to be in pain. There's a lot of problems with this. But this is hail that also has fire uh, that's mingled with it. And that's just so crazy to think about. What could possibly be causing this? I don't know. I mean, it could literally just be that God just said, here's what you're going to do. And here's how the elements are going to respond to do it. You know, from a scientific or a logical standpoint, maybe there was something to do with chemicals in the atmosphere uh, that were uh, igniting or coming up with this, you know, maybe there's a volcanic eruption, sent a bunch of stuff in the air, the storm gathered that stuff up, stopped raining in other places, but turned into hell over here. And as the hell would come down, it impacted, causes a reaction or something. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but this has got to be one heck of a storm to be involved with. Uh, let's see, verse 25 and the hell smote throughout all the land of Egypt, that all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hell smote every herb of the field and break every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hell. So this kind of hell is bad. I mean, it's beating the heck out of you. Your animals are getting beat up. You're probably getting bruises and problems. It's, it's leveling your crops. It's breaking your trees, which is ruining your fruit, your ability to grow food and to do things. They've had... All, you know, most of their animals have died. They've got boils all over them. And I mean, getting hit by the hell by itself is bad. But if you've got to realize if you've got blisters all over your body and you're getting hit with hell, oh man, it's popping blisters. It's increasing the pain. This is miserable. This is absolutely miserable. This is crazy. But the Israelites aren't having any problems with this. That's, that's got to be wild to stand there and go, look at that. Oh my gosh, they're getting destroyed over there and we're not getting anything. So verse 27, and Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time, the Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings in hell. I will let you go and ye shall stay no longer. So this isn't just go and worship and come back. This is go. <laughs> Pharaoh is realizing that he has met his match. Uh, this, he can't, he can't put up with this. This is just devastating. He's literally about to lose his country, not just lose his ability to be in power, but lose his country. Uh, so lots of, he, uh, Pharaoh's got to be pretty beaten down by this point. But not all the way, unfortunately. That's, that's the sad part. All right, verse 29, Moses said unto him, as soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord. And the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hell, that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord's. So something that's important for us to realize is Moses going outside the city and he's going to spread his hands out and raise them up to signal we need to do this different. That comes up again. So remember that a little tidbit. We're going to see that him do that again to, to form another miracle later on. Verse 30, but as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not yet fear the Lord God. 
So uh, Moses is saying in here, basically, that uh, we'll, I'll stop this. We'll do this. This is good. But I'm, you know, I'm not 100% convinced that you are a, a believer yet. Uh, verse 31, and the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was bold. Uh, but the wheat and rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. So what this means, basically, is their flax and barley crops were ready for harvest, and they got destroyed by the hill. The wheat and the rye were beaten, but they weren't ready to be harvested yet. So they might have, they weren't quite there yet. So they might survive, albeit maybe not a full crop like they would have normally had, but they they are probably going to do a little bit better. Verse 33, Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, spread abroad his hands unto the Lord, and the thunders and hell ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hell and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. So Pharaoh changed his mind again the third time. Holy cow, what is it going to take for this guy to realize what's going on here? Everything abates, everything goes, it's getting back to normal, and he decides, you know, that wasn't so bad, I'm not going to let them go. So, crazy Pharaoh, crazy Pharaoh, what's going on here. So, um, just just wild, just wild. And if you're looking at this, thinking flax, barley, wheat, and rye, or is actually spelt as what it was, they had a lot of different types of um, grains that they grew back then. Amaranth actually is one that was a very common one in ancient Egypt. Uh, little balls, little ball grains, non-gluten. It was as it was as bountiful as what we would have today of wheat. So they ate some different grains than we did. Even the wheat we have today uh, didn't exist like 200 years ago. It's 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 been modified a lot. Not the whole GMO genetically modified stuff. But it technically has been crossbred and things to get certain qualities out of it uh, for different reasons. That's a whole other story we don't, we're not going to go into here. Um, it, we'll talk about that probably. Uh, I think we talked about that a little bit in the Word of Wisdom, Section 80, 89 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, if not, mention it in the comments. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about that in another video. But there were lots of, they didn't just have wheat. They had lots of different types of grains. And that was good. That gave their uh, some biodiversity to their uh, diet. Some grains were for their animals and not so much for them to consume. Uh, but having that diversity is important. So that's a good good thing for us, too, to look at what else is out there than just white flour. What else can we be eating that could be healthy for us as well? So uh, just a little, little tidbit to encourage you to venture out there and look for other healthy grains that you can put in your diet that can help you out. So we'll see you in Exodus chapter 10 to see what Moses and the Lord does next now that Pharaoh's changed his mind for the third time.